today, <clears throat> we're on part number five of a series that we began. And some of you guys are first time guests. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Um, for this segment to really make sense, you have to jump on YouTube or the Alive Church app and kind of download what we've talked about the last four weeks. We're on, a um, we're on a series called The Prescription, and what we've realized over the first four weeks is that God still heals. Say it with me. God still heals. Say it again. God still heals. Say it one more time. God still heals. That's important for you to realize, and I don't want to get into a doctrinal debate because I've already laid foundation. But the truth is, is that there's many denominational churches that have been taught that um, the healing have ceased with the canonization of Scripture or that it ceased um, with the coming of the Word of God. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So we are shouting it from the rooftop that God still heals. Are y'all with me today? We've learned that the, uh, the prescription of the great physician is the Word of God. It's like you go to a natural doctor and they give you a prescription. Jesus is considered to be our great physician, and his prescription is his word. And in the word of God, Isaiah 53 says this, verse number 5. It says, but he, and the he is Jesus, was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we, come on, are, come on, healed. And... <clears throat> Many believe that all disease and sickness that we face today come from 39 different roots. Some believe that. And if that's true, which I happen to believe that it is, the stripes that Jesus took on his back, which was 40 minus 1, those 39 stripes was for every disease, sickness, and infirmity that you and I could ever face. And this is what we've come to believe, that what he took, we don't have to take. Would the church say amen? And so when you accept Jesus, you are saved. And that word saved is the word sozo in the Greek. And it doesn't mean that you escape hell alone. It doesn't mean that your sins are paid for alone. That is a part of it, but it's not all of it. It's also that word sozo means wholeness. Everybody say wholeness. Where there's nothing missing, nothing um, lacking, and nothing broken. And, and this word sozo also includes healing. Here's the truth. That when you accept Jesus, that you are already healed. By his stripes, you are healed. 1 Peter 2, 24 says that you were healed. That is a spiritual reality, but now we need it to manifest itself in the third dimension or in this natural world. We need the spiritual reality of the healing that you've already received to manifest itself in your bones, ligaments, tissues, blood, and all in your organs. Would the church please say amen? And we believe that healing is for today, all right? But we also understand that the will of God is not automatic. It has to be fought for and it has to be sought for. I personally am hearing so many healing testimonies now. Everybody that we pray for do, does not get healed, unfortunately, but some people do. And we're going to celebrate the people that do so we can see healing go from occasional to the norm. I got reports this week of someone who had nerve pain in their leg and they couldn't sleep because they was always in pain. Our team prayed for them and now they've been able to sleep and the pain is gone. I got another report this week that somebody was watching online because there's no distance in the spirit. And remember last week when I was talking about God healing back pain, they, were, they had so much back pain, they're out of town, they didn't go to their church so they watched us online. And when I said that, they felt warmth on their back. The pain got a lot better that day. By the next day, it was completely gone, and they went back to work. God healed their back. Come on, somebody say, God still heals. God still heals. This week, I got a testimony of a person who has been deaf in one ear for a year, but now she can hear out of that ear, okay? And so if God is healing backs and opening up ears that wasn't able to hear, God can work in this place today. And I'll share some of my testimony because the first time I had a dealing with, um, with healing, and many of you all have heard this story before, was in 2002, 2023. Now, you got to understand my past. I grew up in a small Baptist, Protestant, small traditional church. We believed in the Holy Spirit. We didn't know about the movements of the Holy Spirit, et cetera, et cetera. So when I got filled with the Holy Spirit in 2001, 2022, healing and things like that was news to me, but I didn't lean out of it because of my tradition. I leaned into it. Very important. And so I had this excruciating stomach pain. I mean, this thing was felt like an appendicitis. It felt like kidney stones. I mean, it was horrible. I couldn't even call my wife. Um, 
I just didn't know what to do. And at the time, we lived outside of um, the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, had a two-bedroom townhome. Tabitha and I, we owned a real estate brokerage. And so we had a, a two-bedroom, three-bedroom townhome, two bedrooms upstairs, one bedroom in the basement, and we turned the whole bedroom into a, a prayer closet. You know, we had one couch in there and things we were believing and praying for all on the wall, stuff like that. I was in so much pain. All I knew to do was go to the prayer room. And I went over there just doubled up. I mean, oh, my God. And all I knew to do was by faith lift up my hands and say, Lord, I love you. Jesus, I believe that I'm healed by your stripes. I give you praise and I worship you. And as I was in pain, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. (laughs) As I was in pain but still walking by faith, glory to God. I felt this warm, kind of like, all I can say was felt like an oil. It was like warm oil came over my head, down my shoulders to the end, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, sit down and go to sleep. And I sat down on that couch, and when I woke up, the pain was completely gone. My point is that God still heals. Haven't had pain like that in 20 years. God still heals. Um, Three or four years ago, I was feeling really bad. I felt hormonal, and I'm a pretty jovial guy. You can tell. I kind of jump up like, let's go for the day. But I just felt like I was dragging. I went to my doctor. They did my blood work, and my thyroid came back sluggish. And I have a world-renowned doctor. He says, what I want you to do is take some nature, throw it. I need you to take this pill once a day. I said, doc, do I have to take this the rest of my life? He says, yes. I said, said, doc, I don't want to take some medicine for the rest of my life. And he says, Ken, it's just a pill. I mean, when you get older, your thyroid can get sluggish, and it's not a big deal. And I respected him, so I did what he said. But that was the report of man, not the report of the Lord. And you got to know how to put them together for faith without works is dead being alone. So I'm listening to the natural. And for two years, I took that medicine. But at the same time as I was taking it, I said, I won't have to take this all the days of my life because by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Two years, by the stripes. And it came that one day I ran out of medicine. And then I called my pharmacist, and it was a compound medicine up in what is up there near Winter Park? It's like Altamonte Springs. So that's where it was. I said, hey, I need some more medicine. They said, we're going to take, is that how you say it? <laughs> y'all know I ain't from here. Y'all, y'all can tell. But um, Y'all stick with me. Y'all stick with me now. I feel, I feel my crowd going somewhere else. Like, what he just say? What? <laughs> All right. They took him two weeks for the medicine to come in. And I realized when I got the medicine for two weeks, I, still, I felt good without medicine. So I said, I'm going to do another two weeks. Two weeks went by, still felt good without medicine. I said, I'm going to take a month. A month went by, still felt good without medicine. Two months went by, I called my doctor. I said, I need to come back in. I need you to do some blood work. I'm sitting in his office. He brings the report in. No lie, this is his exact words. He comes in and he says, Brother Ken, it looks like the Lord has healed your thyroid. That's because God still heals. My son, Kenny, when he was first born, um, he had a condition, what was it, baby, that he, pneumonia, and it got so deep in his lungs that they thought he wasn't going to make it. And the pneumonia was so bad, you know, when you first have a baby, how, how much did Kenny weigh? Nine pounds, 13 ounces. Nine pounds, 13 ounces. And my, my wife is alive to tell the story today. <laughs> right? Nine pounds and 13 ounces. And usually when you have a baby, you want to do skin to skin and you want to nurse. But he was so bad off, we had to rush him to another hospital. So the paramedics come in, and instead of, it was like, get your clothes on. We got to take this baby. We're not, we can't handle this here. We have to take him to a NICU. And for 10, the first 10 days of his life, he was hooked up to tubes, and they was uncertain if he would make it. The respiratory therapist goes to our Gainesville campus, and he told me a couple of years ago, he said, Ken, Pastor Ken, this looked like it didn't look good. I've seen this before. I'm so glad to see. But here's the deal. Kenny just celebrated his 11th birthday this week. Come on, somebody. All right? Because man's plans and God's plans, man's words and God's words are two different things. All right? Matter of fact, we had the first sleepover last night. We had eight 11 years old olds. That's what, yeah, she survived it. She didn't make the first service. She came in here late in the worship, like, I made it. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I, we was at trampoline parks. We just went hard yesterday. But here's the deal. We're celebrating that my son is alive and that God is who he says he is because God still But I've also seen us pray for people and them not make it out so well. And we've had to deal with disappointment. I remember there was this one young lady, she was probably in her 20s, 
in Gainesville and she got cancer and we all came together as a church and prayed. I mean, it felt like the whole church was praying. I mean, I remember getting like 20 people together and going over to her house and I remember worshiping in her house and praying over her and it just felt like God was there. But unfortunately, she went home to be with the Lord and we, we was faced with disappointment. Everybody say disappointment. There was this one young man that used to go to our Gainesville campus. This was years ago. One of the most nice, kindest human beings you will ever meet in your life. But before he rededicated his life to the Lord, he wasn't pure in his sexuality. And when he got rededicated his life to the Lord, he started to live right. And he said, my body's for the Lord and the Lord is for my body and all that good stuff. But unfortunately, before that moment, he had contracted HIV. And HIV, um, back then, they didn't have medicines like now. Now it can be undetected in your blood. But back in the day, the next step was AIDS. And that step came. And so he had full-blown AIDS, and he died. And so, you know, I, I read my Bible, and I'm the kind of person, I don't just read it. I want to live it out. The Bible says, for those who know their God, he will show himself strong and do great exploits. So the Bible says that we heal the sick, cleanse the leper, cast out devils, and raise the dead. So I got three or four pastors with me. I said, we're going to go raise him from the dead. Let's go. This dude is in his 20s. He's getting up to the glory of God. And we go up there with all kinds of confidence. We kick in the hospital doors like Ghostbusters. We're here now. <laughs> I know this is far out for some of y'all, but this is a true story. Listen, I went hard in the world. I'm, I'm definitely going to go hard for God. I don't, have a ha I don't have a halfway in my personality. Okay? And so we prayed, man. We praying in there. We praying in there. And um, unfortunately, he didn't get up. We also felt like after praying for a while that he was at heaven and he was good. He didn't want to come back. And so we was faced with disappointment. And what I've learned over the years, 20 years of ministry, 15 years of being a pastor, is that if you want to move in miracle signs, wonders, and healings, you have to know how to deal with disappointment. So today is part number five of our series, and it's somber, but it's going to be powerful. <laughs> I walked around outside after the last service, and people were like, thank you. I've been dealing with so much disappointment in my walk with Jesus. And so today I want to teach you a message called Dealing with Disappointment. And um, last week I said, this is one you got to be in church for. Remember that? This is like the one, like this is probably the most important message you could ever hear, like after salvation. And I'm not trying to oversell it, so whatever. But I really believe like there are so many believers that are dealing with closet disappointment. Somebody died, something didn't happen, I sowed a seed and I lost a job. And they're dealing with, and disappointment can abort your faith if you're not careful. It is the gangrene of the spirit that tries to bring in skepticism and doubt. And we need to know how to deal with disappointment. So I'm glad you're here today. Matter of fact, give yourself a round of applause for being in the house. You're in the right place at the right time with the right people today, all right? But like any message that you ever hear from a human being, you got to take the meat and leave the bone. There are some things that the Holy Spirit is going to be like, that was for you. Then there are some things that the Holy Spirit is like, that wasn't really for you. That was for somebody else, and I need you to have the wisdom to know the difference. But I believe I'm going to give you a whole lot of meat on today. Somebody say amen. Yeah. And here's the deal. I'm not preaching today as an expert in healing. I'm practicing healing. Like people are practicing medicine, I'm practicing. We're trying to figure this whole thing out. But I have preached the gospel around the world. I'm talking around the world, Australia, India, Africa, Nicaragua, around the world, all right? And I'm like that farmer's commercial that I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. I only know a thing or two, though. I don't know everything. But I'm going to give you the best that I've learned. And I really believe that my best is going to bless somebody on today, okay? And so my hope for you today is that you're going to get, like, the answers to some questions that you might even not know that you need to answer, okay? The answer to, all right? And so, let's start here. What's disappointment? Here's a definition for you. Y'all ready to take some notes? We're going to go to class, then we're going to pray for y'all. It's going to be good today. Let's go. All right. What is disappointment? <clears throat> it is sadness or displeasure caused by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes or expectations. And I want you to focus on these first two words, sadness or displeasure. What, is, what are those two words? Those are emotions. Okay. When it comes to disappointment, you feel let down by God. You feel disappointed. Here's the thing about your feelings. You have them. And we want you to feel it, but we don't want you to stay there. 
I'm not the person that says you shouldn't feel that. You should just walk by faith because truthfully, we all have feelings and emotions. God gave them to us. We just can't let them dominate us. Okay? And so it is sadness or displeasure caused by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes or dreams. Today's message is really about when your feelings fight your faith. That's what disappointment is. Write this down. Disappointment is the enemy to childlike faith. It really is. The Bible puts a premium on us being childlike, us being teachable, pliable, us being pure-hearted, us um, being life learners, okay? The Bible puts a premium on that. However, disappointment has this way to move you out from being child life because of what you've been through. And now your experience actually becomes an idol. Now, idolatry is not just the worship of statues and false gods. It's when you put anything in your life in front of God. Sometimes we put our experience in front of what God's word says. We put what we've been through in front of what God's word says. We put our intellectualism and our philosophy in front of what God's word says, and we need to pull down some idols today, and we have to recommit to be childlike in our faith. Write this down. Disappointment can cause an overfocus on the now with little trust for a better future. Disappointment focuses on your past what you've been through, what it was like for you, what didn't work out before, but faith focuses on the future. Now, I want to declare in advance that your best days are still out in front of you. The glory of the latter shall be greater than the glory of the former. God is perfecting things concerning you. I know the thoughts and the plans that I have towards you, saith the Lord, to bring you to an expected end, thoughts of peace. Come on, somebody. Your best are still out. You cannot let disappointment rob you of the, fu- of, the, of, of the vision for your future. Write this down. Disappointments can become God appointments. Disappointments, if you do it right, won't defeat you, but they will move you into your destiny. And all of the wonderful people that we read about in God's word, all of them that did great things had to overcome disappointment. Peter. Here Peter is thinking that Jesus is going to set up a natural kingdom, and Jesus is arrested and crucified. This brother's disappointed. And he looking at Jesus be arrested, and he denies Christ three times. Thank God he didn't stay in the valley of disappointment. In Acts chapter 2, we see him preaching with power to where the shadow of Peter would heal people because he wasn't defeated by disappointment. He was promoted by it. What about Joseph? The Bible says that he got a dream from God at about 19 years old that he didn't walk into until he was 30 years old. Can you imagine 11, 12 years of the disappointment of the betrayal of family? Anybody ever have your family betray you before? Your best friend betray you before? People that you've done so much for betray you before? The Bible says that Joseph had the call of God on his life. He was falsely accused and put in prison, not for months, but for years. And the butler and the baker forgot all about him, right? Disappointment. But that disappointment didn't defeat him. It moved him into the palace because they're God appointments that you have to process right. Write this down if you can. There's a difference between little disappointments and big disappointments, right? And here are some some little disappointments. Kids made a bad grade on the test. We know about that one. Praise God. (laughs) You didn't get the job you applied for. Nobody here. (laughs) You had one day off, you were going to the beach, and it was rainy on that day. Or worse yet, there was seaweed on the beach. I can't stand that day. I done drove all the way over here, and it smelled like crap. What is this? (laughs) He got your number, but then he didn't call you. That's for the single ladies. Don't worry about that one. You hungry after church, you go to the Cheesecake Factory, and there is a... 45-minute wait. There's always a 45-minute wait. (laughs) What's that? Small disappointments. My word for you when it comes to small disappointments, that's life. (laughs) You got to get over it. Come on now. You got to be big boy. It's amazing. I'm just so sad. I mean, people are so sad nowadays. They're so depressed by just, that's just life. Life is filled with little closed doors because God has a bigger, better door in your tomorrow. Life is filled with things you thought it was going to be this, but it was going to be that. Don't get down, baby. Come on, somebody. Your best is still out in front of you. You got to handle 
little disappointments. But I don't want to deal with the little disappointments today. I want to deal with the big ones. The ones that you go through something, it feels like it knocked the wind out of you. Anybody ever went through something and it felt like, I don't know if I can make it out of this one before? I'm talking about you lost um, a job, you lost a marriage, you lost a child, you lost your retirement and bad investments, you've lost your health and you've been trying to get it back for 10 years. Anybody here ever lost anything before? And I realize about human beings is that we don't know how to process loss very well. We really don't. And here's the answer. We need to invite the Holy Spirit in when we feel that we've lost something and say, God, help me process the loss. But what I do know is if you lose a child, lose a marriage, lose a job, and lose some money, that ain't nowhere as bad as you losing your faith. Because if you take that step to losing your faith, the next step is losing your soul. And there are so many people that don't know how to deal with the loss of a job or relationship, a marriage or a loved one, that they've taken the step to where I don't know if I can believe God any longer. But the next step is that you might just lose your soul. So I want to help you deal with disappointment today. Would somebody say, I'm ready, I'm ready? My question is this. Why is disappointment so high in the faith community? Do you know? Because I really believe, like, as Christians, which I'm talking to mostly Christians, some of you guys are newer to church, but here's the deal. Outside of the church, people don't deal with disappointment how we deal with it, in my my opinion. The reason is, is because in this community, faith is high. And whenever faith is high, disappointment can also be high. Faith and expectation goes hand in hand. You can't really have mountain-moving faith without expectation. Now abide these three, faith, hope, love. The greatest of these is love. What is hope? Hope and expectation is synonymous terms, and this is what it means. To have an outstretched neck anticipating good to happen. You should have come to church today with an outstretched neck, anticipating God to move, anticipating God to speak. You should be in a relationship expecting to be loved again. You should be able to have a conversation expecting it to turn out well. You have to be able to live with high expectation, but with high expectations also come high disappointments. People say, Pastor, I did what the Bible says. I kept it locked till I got that rock. But why is my marriage so bad if I did it right? Because a high expectation also sometimes can come with high disappointment. You say, Pastor, I started tithing and I started giving to God first and then I lost my job. Why? Because you had a high expectation and sometimes high expectation comes with high disappointment. You say, Pastor, I've been forgiving people and living right and eating well and exercising, but now I got this bad doctor's report. Why me? I don't know, but I know high expectation also comes with high levels of disappointment. And here's the answer, church. Are y'all ready? You say, Pastor, maybe I should drop my expectation down. God, no. Don't do that. Because manifestation comes on the heels of expectation. You got to get your expectation up that God's going to be God in every situation. It's not that you bring your expectation down. You have to bring your ability to process disappointment up. So many of us have this high expectation, but we don't handle warfare well. We don't handle the fight well. We don't handle the battle well. And so when we go through anything, we throw in the towel. And my word of the Lord for somebody today is that keep your expectation high, but I want to help you deal with disappointment so it doesn't defeat you, but it promotes you. Would the church please say amen? And so what does the word say? Tell your neighbor, I'm glad you're here today. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 4 watch this in verse number 14 it says seeing then that we have a great high priest who is Jesus who passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast to our confession for we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin verse 16 
Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. If you could just leave verse 16 up, I would appreciate it. The scripture here says that we don't have a high priest who has not been touched with our infirmities. So Jesus knows what it's like to be you. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows, he, the Bible says he's been tempted at all points like we have. He's been tempted to lie and cheat on his Jerusalem taxes, and, I guess. <laughs> he's been tempted in his sexuality. He's been tempted with hatred and bigotry. He's been tempted at all points, but he did not sin. So he is the perfect example of you and I that with all sin, he always makes a way of escape. Jesus was tempted with betrayal. He was tempted with fatherlessness. Sometimes I read the Bible and I said, what happened to Joseph, Jesus' father? And the Bible doesn't explain what happened to Joseph, but because Joseph wasn't around at the crucifixion, I think it's safe to assume that he either passed away or um, he left. So whatever the case may be, he lost a parent. Okay? Jesus knows what it's like to be disappointed. And so, he, so you can go to him. So what's the answer, 16? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find. God, help me with my disappointment. My hope for you today is that you won't go to the bag of weed when you get disappointed, that you won't go to the club and into alcohol when you get disappointed, and you won't go to online illicit sexual activity when you get disappointed, but you'll go to the throne of grace so that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need because you don't have a God that is far. You have a God that's close. First Peter chapter number four. Watch this one. Write this down. Beloved. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which has come to try you as though something strange is happening to you. I think sometimes when believers, we go through things, we're like, what in the world is going on? It says, don't think it's strange that you're going through things right now. Write this down. I want you to normalize disappointment. The disappointment is a part of life, but his grace is sufficient for you to get through it. I also want you to normalize warfare. Um, one of the partners of our church here, um, I see her after service sometimes, and for the last few times I've seen her, she comes up and she says, Pastor, I'm going through so much, and she is. She's going through things that many of us aren't going through right now, and my heart goes out, and I'm standing in faith with her. But this last time she came up to me, I just had a word of the Lord in my heart, and I was like, hey, can I give you some advice? She says, what? I said, I want you to normalize warfare. Don't be caught off guard that your marriage is under attack or that your finances are under attack. It's something strange is happening to you. This is coming for your destiny because there is an anointing in your life and there's a great calling in your life and you've been called to be a Pio woman. It's amazing that sometimes we get like, I can't believe I'm going through this. Believe it, it's a fallen, broken world. This is not our home. We passing through. Somebody say amen. And when it comes to disappointment, one of my keys of advice would be you have to normalize disappointment. Like, people are going to let you down every once in a while. You're going to go, the Bible says it this way, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver us out of them all. Praise God. So in the end, I'm going to have victory. Come on. I'm happy to say that my wife is nine months cancer-free now. Come on, somebody, nine months cancer-free. Hair is growing back. Looks very nice. Nine months cancer-free. Just celebrated three days ago. You say, why would you do that? We're going to just celebrate what God's doing. You say, but what if it comes back? But what if it doesn't? See, Nahum 1.6 says to us that affliction will not arise a second time. And um, not only that, we have a rhema word, it's settled. So we go to war with that. You say, but what about what's happened? I don't know why, but I know what his word has said to me. So for me, that's what I believe, that's what I speak, and that's how I act, and that's how God moves. I can't explain everything around me. I can just say where my feet is, is planted. For me, his word is forever settled in heaven. Okay, let's go with me over to Romans chapter 8. I'll give you another scripture for today. Romans 8, it says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those. Oh, I love this one. Who love God. Anybody here love God? Yeah. Those who are called according to his purposes. Keep that up for a moment. All right. Now, how many of you all know who Joyce Meyer is? Let me see by a show of hand if you know who Joyce Meyer is. If you do not know who Joyce Meyer is, I want you to go home today, get on YouTube and put in the word Joyce Meyer, and then I want you to download her podcast she, to me, is one of the greatest Bible teachers and evangelists in our generation. She really is. And um, she has one of the largest platforms of people that she's reached around the world. Now, Joyce is probably in her mid-70s, 
upper 70s, I think. Right, sweetheart? She's probably 70-some. And so I listen to Joyce like every week pretty much. It's just, you know, I like older people that I listen to. I feel like they have a lot of wisdom. <clears throat> and I'm going to say something that I need you to brace yourself for. Go ahead and tell your neighbor. You got to brace yourself for this. One. Brace, 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 brace yourself for this. One. Okay. So I was listening to Joyce, and she told the story of her past. And she said that she was raped by her natural father over 100 times growing up. And um, the story goes on that says because of that, she was, man, battled with her mental health and her emotional health, and she battled in her relationships and all these things that she went through, but she forgave her father through the process. She forgave him so much to towards the end of his life, she paid for a house for him and took care of him and her mother. Towards the end of his life, she, water, she got him water baptized, and she just forgave him, took care of him, overcame evil with good, and then he passed away. God has given her a ministry around the world. <laughs> and she said this. I was listening to it. This is what she says. She says that I would have changed nothing about what I've been through because it made me the woman I am today. Yeah. What? What kind of revelation are you walking in to where you would look at the pain of abuse from a father figure and you in your 70 years old will look back at the evil that was done to you and say, you know what, because of who I am today, I would even do it again. Because of all of the millions of people that I've been able to heal and help around the world, I would change nothing about my past. I don't know about you, but I ain't there yet. <clears throat> but I appreciate the comment. You know what I'm saying? I'm sitting listening like, wow, that, that's crazy. What's that? That's a revelation of what to do with your disappointment. Now, how many of you all have ever been through anything painful in your childhood or painful in your past? Come on, tell the truth today. Lift up your hands if that's you. Don't you understand that's where your books come from? That's where the music comes from. That's where the prophetic moment comes from. That's where your ministry comes from. It's not the mountaintop. It's actually the valley. And the things that don't defeat you actually promote you. And the things that you hated about you are the things that God actually wants to use. It's why the oil on your life is so great. It's because of what you've endured and overcome. Are y'all with me today? And this is what we believe, that all things are working together for our good. And it might not feel good. It might not look good. I might have wished it didn't happen. But somehow, some way, God is still putting all of the pieces of my life together to get me to this moment. And I won't mess it up because I'm mad at him. He has the ability to take what the devil is meant for evil and turn it around for our good with the church say amen. amen. And so in closing, what can we do with disappointment then when believing God for a healing? Anybody here ever believe for a healing? Anybody here? Okay, now there's sick people all around us. God knows we're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know. We're in the middle. I'm done with the pandemic. Whatever. Listen, there's sick people all around us. We need an anointing to heal the sick. But this is what I want you to know. What can we do with disappointment when believing God for a healing? Write this down. You have to choose up front, and this is long, that no matter what I go through in my life, I will never back away from God. I will not allow disappointment to stay in my heart. And the church said, Amen. There is a power in your choice. God has given you a free will, and you have to choose before you get in the battle what your response is going to be. So when Tabitha was diagnosed with breast cancer last year, I had to consider both outcomes. I had to consider it because I needed to choose up front that whether she lives or not, I will serve God faithfully, and I will go on and still believe God to heal other people. I didn't stay there. I'm talking about 5% of me considers it, and after I make that choice, I move on. 95% of me is focused on the Word of God, and healing is in my house, and thank God that she's celebrating nine months of being cancer-free because that's where I park at. But I don't want to be caught off guard. I know there's so many people that things happen, and it's like, 
Well, listen, we live in a fallen, broken world, and you see through a glass dimly. We stand flat-footed and bold on the Word of God, but I need to know how to deal with some disappointment. There was a guy who was a part of our, our church, and his wife was young, and she passed away from cancer. And I was kind of going through some same things, so we would meet for coffee, and I would just try to encourage him, and we would text each other, and I would encourage him, and then one day I got a text from him. And he says, man, I can't do the whole God thing no more. I can't do this whole church thing. I'm just, I'm hurting. And I haven't talked to him in a while. The problem is that he didn't choose that no matter what I go through in my life, I'm going to serve God. See, I chose up front that when I get into the battle, I'm leaning into God instead of leaning out of God. There's a study that says that 80% of atheists become atheists because they prayed for somebody and they wasn't healed and they concluded that God doesn't exist. And I want you to know that God is, he's real, he's good, and he also loves us. They concluded incorrectly, all right? One of my closest uncles, his name is Greg. Greg taught me how to swim. I learned so much from my uncle Greg. And about five years ago, um, his wife, she passed away, like all of a sudden from a sickness. And she passed away. They've been married about 30 years, I believe. And he'd been serving the Lord for all 30 years. And I remember going up to the homegoing service after service, I thought he'd be somewhere crying and people would be consoling him. At the end of service, I'm standing at the stage, I'm looking back, he had stayed there to the last person left. And he was praying for people and encouraging people and smiling and laughing because he knew to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so I really want to do a part of this series where we teach about dealing with death because I've realized that many Christians don't know how to deal with death. And the Bible says that we don't grieve like those who have no hope. And like, if a, and if a person is saved, it's not an expiration when they die, it's a promotion. God. And I know so many people are dealing right now with the fear of death. It's been in our media. People are scared to die. I'm like, all of us have an expiration date. That's when you, you want to know where you're going. You need to know that you're right with God. And so Jesus in the gospel, he says this. He says, he who believeth in me will never die. Believeth thou this? That's the New King James Version. I'm sorry. What he was saying is that when you die, your body returns, but your spirit and soul will live on forever. So when you get born again, eternal life doesn't start in heaven. It starts when you accept Jesus. And just because you get a new body doesn't mean that you've died. You do not stop existing. You transform. You trans... You, oh, my God. You go from the natural realm to the spiritual realm because the spiritual realm is more real than the natural realm because everything you see came from the place that you can't see. So when it comes to death, Jesus says, oh, death, where is your sting? Because now I got a revelation that if I leave here, Paul said it himself. He says, it's good that I go for me, but for you, you want me to stay around. Like for me, it's good that I go, but for you, you want your pastor here, right? You want somebody giving you the word, right? I would love to go be with Jesus. No sorrow, no pain. I can just worship him without all y'all's drama. You know what I mean. But we got work to do. Come on, somebody. You're not here by an accident. You are in this place with purpose and for purpose, not just to work some dead-end job. God's hand is on you. We got work to do. Come on, get three people around you and say, you got work to do. Oh, death, where is your sting? And so, for, I'm a Bible nerd. Here's the deal. The Bible promises us healing, and the Bible also promises us long life. Did you know that? The Bible says that as human beings, we should live three score and 10, that's 70 years. In Genesis 3, it says the number of a man's days will be 120 years. According to God's perfect will, well, this is his perfect will. His perfect will is that we would know no death. That's what it was in Eden. Death is not supposed to be a punishment from God. It's a benefit. So when we stepped out of the will of God and sin came in, he didn't want Adam and Eve to eat the tree of life so that we could live forever separated from him. So he gave us the gift of death. Where is this coming from? I'm telling you, I ain't thought nothing about this. He gave us the gift of death so we wouldn't remain forever separated from him. And so in the garden, he had a plan of redemption. He says the serpent will hit your heel and the heel will hit his. So in, in, in the garden, he has a plan of redemption saying that I'm going to buy men back from spiritual death. So natural death is a gift so people can get born again. And then I'll give you a resurrected body and we will live in the new Jerusalem, which is a new earth. 
and a, it's not like heaven is it's just heaven. No, we're going to come to a new Jerusalem where we will reign forever with Jesus with no sickness, depression, abortion, sorrow, division, racism, and none of that. We are not from around here. We are just passing through. Come on, church, and we got work to do. Two million souls in 20 years. Come now in the name that's above every name. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you today? You're not here by an accident, beloved. Come on, a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-generational church right here in Orlando saying, nations, come over here. We're going to give them Jesus. Hallelujah. All to the glory of God the Father. And so I'm excited, and my mic is flipping off my head. But number two, I want you to start to focus more on what God is doing more than what he's not. So my mom was diagnosed with cancer at the end of 2020. All 2021 to today, she's still in chemotherapy. A couple of weeks ago, she had a PET scan, and we're believing for a miracle. No cancer. And my mom is the strongest man. She's so strong in faith right now. I'm like, oh, my God, that's where I get it. I didn't know she was so strong. And we got the report back, and this is what the doctor report said. You still have cancer. But... It's not any worse. And it looks like it's a little bit better. You're tempted to be disappointed. Like, God, we've been praying for a whole year. What's going on? I said, don't do that. Let's celebrate the fact that it's not worse. Let's celebrate the fact that it's a little better. Because if God is making it a little better, he can make it a lot better. And if you make it a lot better, he can make... See, some of y'all are waiting on a full healing to give him praise. If you feel any better today than you did yesterday, you need to thank God for what he's doing and stop looking at what he's not doing. Come on, church. Come on, worship team. I'll give you one more. And this is number three. How do I deal with disappointment? You have to practice the palms up principle. This might be the most important advice that I've ever gotten in my life is the palms up principle. So I go to therapy, not because things are bad, so that things don't get bad. And I usually go and see my psychologist. I think he's retired and I need to find somebody else now. Every other year. Last time we were together, I was venting and telling him like, man, I can't stand you. I can't stand people. I can't, you know how you do. You just go vent. You don't really mean it, but you know, he's paid to listen, so here you go. And so I, I said to him, he said, Ken, you know what your problem is? He says, you don't expect difficulties. And as long as you don't accept the fact that life is not going to be easy, but it's difficult, you're always going to be looking for ways to be more happy and to remove the ease. That's why people overdrink and overeat, because they just want to be happy. But Jesus says, as long as you're in this world, you're going to have trouble. Be, 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 be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He drops this knowledge on me, and then he says, I'm going to teach you a principle for your life. And it's called the palms up principle. Everybody do like this. And this is for free. I paid $5,000 for it, but this is for free. <laughs> this is your true story. He says, and whenever you're going through something in your life that you don't like and you don't understand, put your palms up like this and say, nevertheless, Lord, I trust you. Say it with me. Nevertheless. It hurts, but I still trust you. I don't get it, but I still trust you. I don't like it, but I still trust you. The word says this, but I got that. I was nice, but people was mean to me. God, I still, nevertheless, Lord, I trust you. Everything else is us getting into pride. The highest form of faith to me is trust. It's not you declaring it and prophesying over the dead bones and using your authority. That's a part of faith. But the highest part of faith is to say at the end of the day, you know better than what I do. I believe your word, and I've done everything that I can in the natural. Now, I'm going to rest. And nevertheless, Lord, I trust you. I want to pray for somebody today, for somebody who wants to put their trust in Jesus. And I believe that there are many people who are here that you're not at peace with God. And maybe you've been far away from God. And truthfully, you're a good person. You do so much for the community and so much for your family. But your salvation is based upon your works and being a good person. And the Bible says that your works are filthy rags before holy God. You need a relationship with Jesus. Not a head knowledge, but a heart transformation. You don't have to be a perfect person.
to be right with God, but you do need to surrender. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I would like to pray a five-second prayer with you for you to put your faith in Jesus. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to hold, know the whole Bible. You just have to make up your mind that, God, I want you, and I surrender my life to you. In just a moment, if that's you, when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand for a moment and just kind of wave at me. Then you can put it down so that I can count who's making that decision today. But I'm telling you, you want your name to be found in the book of life. The Bible says that your name can be blotted out. How do you get your name not to be blotted out? By a personal relationship with Jesus. And if you're here today, I'm not offering you religion because I had it for 10 years of my life and it had no power in it. But if you want a relationship with the one and true living God, here's your opportunity. So if that's you today and you say, Pastor, pray for me, man. I want to be saved. I want to be at peace with God. I want to be forgiven. I want to be right with God. I want to put my trust in Jesus. On the count of three, boldly lift up your hand, kind of wave at me. Then you can put it down on one, two, three. Lift it up high all over the building. Say, Pastor, pray with me. Thank you. I see your hand, 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 your hand in the back. All right. I believe this, that there was someone who's here that should have lifted their hand, but for whatever reason you didn't, here's your second chance because God is a God of a second chance. If you say, Pastor, I want to be included in that prayer. I'm 90% sure I'm saved, 95, but I don't know with 100% certainty, but I would like to know that today. Can you lift up your hand? right now all over the building if that's you lift it up say pastor thank you for a second chance thank you I see your hand thank you I see your hand thank you I see your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand I'll even say this if you're here and you know that you're saved but you haven't been living fully for God and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord today if that's you lift up your hand you say I'm saved but I ain't been living for him but I want to thank you I see your hand I want to recommit my life to Jesus thank you I see your hand I want to I want to get it right with him today thank you I see your hand and here's the deal with every head bowed and eye closed make this between you and the Lord not your neighbor they're not gonna be there on the day of judgment it's just you and Jesus I want you to say this to him nobody prays by praise alone let's say it say it out loud together say Lord Jesus come into my heart today forgive me of my sins from this day forward, I'm yours and you're mine. Thank you that 2,000 years ago, you died on a cross just for me, to heal me, to restore me, and to save me. And I receive you as my Lord and my Savior right now. In Jesus' name, I am saved. Welcome to the family of God. The best prayer that you could ever pray, you just prayed it. Today's your spiritual birthday. I want to pray for some people. It's not over yet. I want to pray. I want God to move. If you're here today and you've been dealing with disappointment and you know that that thing has grabbed hold of your heart and you want to take a stand against disappointment and you want to say, I am done with disappointment, so help me God, can you stand up real quickly all over the building? Just stand right now. Just stand and say, I'm done. I'm taking a stand against disappointment. You're disappointed of where you are in life. You figured that you would be further along right now. You're disappointed by how much money you have in the bank. You're disappointed of where you are. Okay, here's the deal. Give yourself a break. You don't have, you don't have to be perfect. Okay, give yourself a break. You're, you're good. Okay, give yourself a break. You're, you're okay. You love the Lord. God's going to start restoring and rebuilding. But we want to help you today because sometimes disappointment brings along depression, despair, and hopelessness. So I'm going to ask some people that are around you, if you see somebody that's standing up, can you just stand around them? Put your hand on their shoulder. Now in the back, up in the balcony up there, there's some people up that way. Y'all might just have to turn to each other and just, I believe that the Holy Spirit's going to use this as a holy moment. There's people standing in the front. Just turn to one another. Grab a shoulder. Grab a back. The people that are standing, just put everybody, just touch some doggone body all over the church. Just touch somebody. Touch somebody. Touch somebody. Come on, let's pray. There's power in our agreement. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, he's here 
He's here, Holy Spirit, come. And so we just declare over you right now that that, that, oh, that spirit of heaviness is being exchanged with a garment of praise right now. That the pain that you've experienced from the loss of a loved one, the loss of a marriage, the things that you've been embarrassed about and you've been condemned about, that God has not given you a spirit of condemnation, but he's given you a spirit of liberty. And we pray right now that that disappointment is being replaced with joy. So we come against that spirit of depression and heaviness and despair, and we curse it at its root, and we command it to leave you right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare that who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so everybody say this, Holy Spirit, come right now, move in their hearts and move in their minds in a mighty way. Restore that which has been broken. And we pray that God has given you beauty for ashes. He's giving you an oil of joy for mourning. I declare your best days are out in front of you, and now you are anointed to deal with the disappointment. Glory to God, for you have on the full armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation. You are anointed for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. You all can look this way. Woo! Y'all feel good? Feel good? Hey, glory. God is here, y'all. Hey! <laughs> now, listen. So I'm preparing this message, right? And I felt like the Lord gave me a confession, which is basically a prayer. The word confession comes from a Greek word, homologio. Homo, same, logio, the logos word of God. It's where you say what God says. Now, some of y'all have been saying what other people say. You need to say what God says until you see what God has been saying. And so this is something that came out of my spirit with no edits at all. And I want you to state this together by faith. Are y'all ready? We're going to do it together. Put it up on the board. Y'all ready? I've got this because God's got me. I'm not defined by my past or my mistakes. I'm defined by God's word to me and over me. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only and never beneath. I'm chosen by God. Come on. Hand selected by God to love him and be loved by him. Everything that has happened to me has happened for me. All things are working together for my good. I will not fret, be anxious, sad, or disappointed anymore. Where I am is a good place to be. I am wiser now. I am stronger now. I am more ready to be used by God now. And since I'm not dead, God's not done. I'm free. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm free from fear, worry, and unbelief. I'm free from sadness, anger, and despair. I'm free from depression, hopelessness, and regret. And God knows I'm free from disappointment. My future is bright. My best days are ahead of me. I put my palms up today and every day and say, nevertheless, God, I trust you. I'm yours and you are mine. Let's go in Jesus' name. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to a live online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in a live church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change your life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, It'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow into the ministry of a live church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you, and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.